Hello everyone, um, my name is uh, Oliver Deak, I'm the CTO of SEBA and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this um, Sunset event um, brought to you by SEBAversity in collaboration with the um, Crypto Valley Association here in our X space of SEBAversity in Zouk and of course also recorded and broadcasted online. Today's talk is going to be about OpenVASP. So this is all about uh, anti-money laundry and combating of the financing of terrorism in the context of crypto, which, as you all know, has the stigma to be the um, kind of um, method of choice for criminals around the world to launder the proceeds of their illicit activities. Um, I did a quick research, and I think just to put it into context globally, the uh, United Nations Office of um, Drugs and Crime estimated that about 2 to 5 percent of all of the um, global um, gross domestic product is actually used for money, money laundry annually, which is about 800 billion to 2 trillion according to their estimation. And um, if, we put, uh, the, if we look at last year's GDP, that can be up to about 4 trillion. Um, I also had a look at the um, latest cybercrime report from uh, Chainalysis, and they estimate about 1.1% of all crypto transactions are due to illicit activities, which amounts to about 11 billion. So there's obviously a sizable difference. However, with the adoption of crypto, um, regulated financial institutions need to kind of play the same rules as all the others. And this is where OpenVASP comes into play, um, offering a solution um, on how to deal with um, AML and um, CFT. And so I'm very pleased to welcome three speakers today who are going to present us OpenVASP. We have um, Chris Schwend from Enemy, member of the board of the OpenVASP Association, Lukas Hook from Signum, also board member, and David Rigelnik, the uh, president of the OpenVASP Association and also the author of the white paper on OpenVASP. So please welcome our speakers and uh, enjoy the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Seba for hosting us today and giving us a chance to present um, OpenVASP uh, in greater detail. So um, at MME, we very often have a number of clients come to us, um, and when it comes time to talk about AML, uh, we're always surprised, in particular in the last year, um, to what extent people are really not familiar with the travel rule, either have not heard of it or, or are not familiar with how it's different in Switzerland. And in particular, um, a lot of them who do know some element about the travel rule don't really understand much about the solutions that are available in the market or how the Swiss market is different than the rest of the world. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is give you an overview on um, what is the genesis or where comes you know, the term travel rule, um, what is the legal framework, just so that you understand why there are these requirements, and then we'll jump into explaining to you a little bit about the tech and the solution that OpenVASP proposes, and then um, talk to you a little bit about our association. So, do we have a... All right, so um, in 1996, um, if we take a step back to the US, uh, FinCEN actually was aiming to give more information to law enforcement to be able to trace who was sending transactions through the, tra the traditional banking system. And so they wanted to incentivize banks to not only g gather more information about um, who's sending the transactions, but also to transmit it to the parties. So the travel rule was created back in the day and it was first um, introduced by the US in the Bank Secrecy Act in 96. So just a bit of a piece of background that the travel rule is certainly not anything new, it's something that has been a requirement in the US for quite some time. Um, the, the Financial Action Task Force is the global overarching organization that is responsible for anti-money laundering. And the FADF, as we, as we call it, has been around and has been quite active in the virtual asset space for quite some time. So already in 2014, they came out with some guidance trying to give the anti-money laundering community an overview of how virtual assets or digital assets as they were called at the time, or digital currencies even, 
um, how they could or should be regulated within each member state. So their positions have evolved over time, but now um, in the most recent publication in 2019, they came out with a really impactful guidance, which basically said of all of their 40 recommendations, it was very clear that they should apply to the activities involving virtual assets and that any service provider that deals with virtual assets, so virtual asset service provider or VAS, should also be subject to um, their 40 recommendations for the prevention of uh, laundering of funds or the financing of terrorism. So I'm, all, I'm not going to go through all 40, but there are two that stand out that are relevant um, for our discussion today. And the first one is recommendation 15. So again, this is global recommendations or just recommendations, but because the FATF is such a, um, a strong um, enforcement branch, um, any member state who fails on the enforcement side um, can be even blacklisted from um, the financial um, uh, market and economy. So um, compliance with the FATF recommendations is strongly um, encouraged and basically a must de facto. So FATF recommendation 15, which is implemented in Switzerland in our national um, legislation as well under the Anti-Money Laundering Act, um, basically requests or suggests that member states, again, strongly suggests that member states um, regulate virtual asset service providers and not only regulate them, but make sure that they're registered, licensed, and supervised. And again, for those who are not familiar with the terms, a virtual asset is a digital representation of value. I think we're all familiar. We don't want to spend too much time there. But I think it's important to spend a little bit of time on understanding who is a virtual asset service provider. Basically, as per the FATF, and also in Switzerland, a VASP is anybody who exchanges um, virtual assets and fiat currencies, but also in Switzerland, if you do a, a virtual asset to a virtual asset exchange, you're also caught. Um, if you exchange between uh, one, or, one or more forms of virtual asset, if you transfer virtual assets, um, if you safe keep them, so any kind of custodial services, um, and if you participate in the provision of financial services related to an issue. So in Switzerland, just to bring that to sort of in a more concrete way, who is caught by the definition of VASP or who is subject to eventually um, anti-money laundering provisions, you have custodial service providers. So custodial, by that we mean that you as your, or the service provider has access, access to your private key. So you cannot enact a transaction without the custody's, uh, the custodial service provider's support you are issuing either a payment token or a hybrid token that has a payment function and any other type of function. Um, you are transferring services or transferring um, value between three parties um, and a number of other types of activities that are traditional financial intermediation activities like online gambling um, and, and banking. So there are a number of ways in which you can fall under the def definition of virtual asset service provider um, and that you can be caught by the anti-money laundering regulations. So, just to understand that, that first element. And then the crux or the, the really the key of the travel rule comes under recommendation 16. So you may have heard of that before. Travel rule, recommendation 16, they come together. So basically under recommendation 16, they require that any VA transfers, so any virtual asset transfers above $1,000, that's a FADF. Um, threshold between a VASP and any other obliged entity, so that's any other VASP, has to transfer basically these elements, so the originator's name, account number, and physical address, and the beneficiary's name and account number. So I think in practical terms, you can think about it as this. If Bob and John buy flowers for their mom uh, for her birthday, and Bob wants to pay back John, and Bob has his account at SABA, then essentially SABA has to obtain information on John before transferring the funds to John's account. So that's a very simple way of explaining that if you are, if you have your virtual assets with a custodial provider like SABA Bank um, or any other bank or any other exchange or any custody service provider, that VASP has to transmit the information on your virtual asset transaction. So it seems a little bit counterintuitive to the crypto community, um, and we understand that there's been a lot of backlash from the community um, over the last years, 
but the reality is that it is a, a, requirement, a requirement in Switzerland, and we'll see why. Basically, um, the FADF came out with a guidance, uh, like I said, in 2019, which went into detail on what the requirements are. I won't spend too much time speaking about it, but here's how it looks in Switzerland. So the FADF comes out with their recommendations. 16 is the one that's the most relevant for the travel rule. Um, the, in, within Switzerland, the equivalent of recommendation 16 can be found in Article 10 of the AMLO FINMA. And then um, for those who are supervised by a self-regulatory organization, um, the travel rule can be found in Article 13, and the brand new um, version of the, in particular, VQFSROs have an additional Article 14 that provides more information on the transmission of data. So um, this is probably the most important slide and probably the biggest takeaway. In Switzerland, unfortunately, um, not unfortunately, I should spin that in a, in a more positive way. So FINMA was very ambitious when they provided information to the community yeah. about how the travel rules should be implemented. Um, and in particular, they really aim to ensure that all Swiss financial intermediaries have a full overview of who the beneficial owner is of any um, recipient um, of any transaction that's uh, sent by a Swiss VASP. So that means that if a Swiss VASP wants to send assets to another VASP, they need to understand who the beneficial owner is. But if a Swiss VASP also wants to send assets to a private wallet, so an external private wallet, FINMA requests that that Swiss VASP um, understands who the beneficial owner is of that external wallet. So it's, a, it's a quite a complicated um, uh, setting. It's a bit different um, than what are the recommendations of the, of the FATF. And, it's a little bit more onerous that, than what um, other FATF members have to implement. But nevertheless, the advantage is that if you're a Swiss VASP, if you implement the provisions of FINMA correctly, you have um, the benefit of being able to understand who the beneficial owner is of all the um, wallets with whom you're interacting. So your chances of abiding or assisting in the laundering of funds or in the transferring of assets to a terrorism organization are lower. So again, coming back to the example with Bob and John, um, SEBA would have to obtain information on John's mycelium or Jack's wallet if they wanted to transfer assets for Bob to John. So, so from Bob's custodial account to John's private account. So basically, all this to say that in Switzerland, not only do Swiss VASPs have to implement some sort of a, a, a second layer protocol or a, to have a technical means in place to transfer information between parties. They also have to have a technical way to detect what kind of wallet um, is on the receiving end and to identify who the beneficial owner is, um, the identity of the owner, and also some other requirements um, that are a little bit more onerous but that can be found in 02-2019, payments on the blockchain. So as you can imagine, um, this is a new requirement and Aldo was implemented in 2019 or introduced in 2019 by the FADAP. It's taking quite some time for, for most of the members to implement their regulatory framework. Um, the FADAP came out just a few months ago with a 12-month review where they basically did a um, um, a survey of all their members to see how far they were along with the implementation of the travel rules, so recommendation 16 in their respective jurisdictions. And so basically they said that less than half members, so again, FATF has proper members, about 30 or 40, and they have also FATF style regional bodies where there is additional members. So of those members that are directly members of the FATF, half, and of the wider FATF community, even less, have already implemented um, the travel rules. So that means there is a sunrise period where only a handful of FATF members currently have implemented the travel rule. So the community is struggling a little bit at the, at the, at the present time to, um, to, to transact with other VASPs that have different uh, requirements within their own regulatory framework in their own jurisdiction. So enforcement, this is the last bit I think for the time being, quite a few members are keen, those that have uh, the requirement, like in Switzerland, in our Article 10, 
um, are keen to put a little bit more pressure on the community to implement a technical solution to comply with Recommendation 16. Um, there is some guidance in the FATF methodology on enforcement, um, and we've seen in, in, the, in the latest enforcement activities from the FATF um, in certain jurisdictions that they are already um, looking into how the different members are implementing the travel rule. Uh, we know, for example, that FinCEN has also told their entire community that there's an expectation that by the end of this year, so by the end of 2020, they have implemented a technical solution. Let's see if um, the realities of 2020 have altered that, but certainly within Switzerland as well, FIN was very keen uh, to see um, our community take a leadership role, and, um, and that's why OpenVAS was created in the first place. So without further ado, let's learn a little bit more about what is OpenVASP and the technical solution from David. <clears throat> thank you, Chris. <clears throat> so, and first of all, a big thank you to Seba to, that has brought us together here. It's excellent, I think. It shows how collaboration is important because let me start. My name is David Rogelnik. I'm working for Bitcoin Swiss, which is of course a competitor of SEPA in the Swiss market. But I think it was quite clear when you, when you see, when you look at the topic that uh, whenever we realized what really we are up to as, as intermediaries in the crypto market, we need to work together uh, to, to, make, to, to basically comply with this topic. I think this is really a perfect example. And so uh, SEPA, uh, uh, together with Signum, uh, Luke, uh, Bitcoin Swiss, MME and Avalok uh, basically came together and uh, also in this place actually to some extent and, and figured out how we really can come up with a protocol, an open protocol, how we can really exchange these messages. And I think it's obvious, the, the challenge for the crypto industry is, is, is therefore obvious because we have been quite used that we basically operate with peer-to-peer -peer, uh, transactions, right? There is no, no per se a need to also send another, let's say, message along. Uh, to make the transaction happen. Um, now, but with this, with this requirement, really, once for beneficiary and, 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 uh, and originator information, um, there is a need uh, to organize this. And while, of course, this can be done point to point by simple messages, you could use an email, an encrypted email, an encrypted PDF, and guess what we do right now? We do use these simple type of, of, of means to basically uh, be, be in compliance. But while this can be done in a simple point to point manner, uh, we very early on figured out that can't be the way. We really are looking for a network, like a SWIFT-like approach. But of course, being crypto, we don't want to basically repeat the centralized SWIFT approach. It must be a bit more decentralized and more with respect uh, that it really fits the, the crypto uh, situation. So we set ourselves a couple of design principles when designing the OpenVAS protocol. It, of course, must really be robustly and resiliently uh, uh, ensure compliance and really be that, that network, that open protocol where these type of messages can be exchanged. Um, it should nevertheless, as mentioned before, follow a decentralized approach. So basically without any central gatekeeper, without any mandatory need for central registration um, or being a member in an organization, and even though you will hear out the association, that is not a requirement to use OpenVAS to make this very clear. Um, so it really has to be decentralized and also because we don't want to lose what really are key um, enhancements, key benefits of the crypto revolution, the crypto financial, financial revolution. Um, it should be technology agnostic in a sense, work with all the blockchains, we know the variety of tokens and constant innovation going on. So it must really be an overlay protocol without being too much uh, interwoven, let's say, with the, with the individual transactions. Uh, privacy by design, very robust end-to-end -end encryption, as mentioned before, it's crystal clear. Um, we by now have actually even several layers of encryption, encrypting not only the message layer, but also the message layer, um, which is really important. Um, broad applicability, the world, this is a, a large world. We have many different vans, right? We have exchanges, we have brokers, we have, we have OTC, different styles. Um, we have retail, we have, we, have, we have, let's say, more private banking or, or oriented crypto uh, providers of ASPs. And they really face different situations with respect to volume, size, tokens. Uh, we have smart contract ba based, based uh, um, offerings, right? I mean, we all know the DeFi hype, but we have seen it coming anyway. So I think from that perspective, we very early on also, we're really looking for an open and layered protocol that already would also, for example, allow pot 
potential even smart contracts to be to act as an actor in this protocol. And last but not least, yes, it must be extensible, so different flavors, uh, country-specific rules. And let me also say here, um, I think we have been really pleased that um, the, uh, let's say, the interest adoption of Open Wasp protocol it, it goes way beyond Switzerland. I think we have an uh, excellent um, uh, uh, support, particularly in the Asian area, Asian region, across Europe, selectively in the US. Um, typically, within those jurisdictions, where we similar as in Switzerland, um, have a regulator who really basically is, is pushing the travel rule agenda. There are some countries which are a bit more relaxed. No wonder we have a little bit less interest there. But we are basically, uh, we, we face these regulations and so does uh, many others across this globe. It must be efficient, of course. As mentioned before, straight through processing is important. It cannot be that it basically is a simple point-to-point message-by-message protocol. So without going too much in details today, I think it is a an, an, an quick overview, but I think what are the key building blocks? As you would expect, yes, of course, we are not shy to say that we have been inspired by SWIFT and other, uh, other uh, modern uh, payment uh, messaging protocols. However, tailored for our case, um, it clearly, I think it's important to really come out with a clear protocol communication flow, very basically uh, uh, between two nodes of the system in an automatized way, basically ask, do you want to talk to me? Yes, I would like to talk to you because maybe I like your jurisdiction or maybe not, but maybe it's a sanctioned one, right? Um, then of course, okay, here I would like to basically do a transaction. Uh, there is a client of mine who basically tells he would like to make a transaction to one of your clients or maybe his account or her account with the other uh, VASP. Is that true? Are you willing to accept the transaction? Yes, I am. Okay, you do the transaction and then you confirm. So there is a whole flow to it. There are some error situations, some edge cases, they need to be configured. That's what we call the protocol flow. There is an addressing schema. As mentioned before, we want to really not make, want to have a system where you basically read each and other individual counterpart, you basically have to establish it from, from scratch, right? No, it should be really with a smart addressing that when you know the, the, the code of the VASP, so to speak, that you can directly send a message, but still maintain the decentrality. And we basically have achieved this with you by using a smart contract approach where you as a VASP establish your identity and basically then you can publish there your public keys that are used for, for encryption. So nothing rocket science, but it simply must be done. Authentication and encryption, as you would expect, of course, it, we, we, we use the, 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 most, the most secure uh, uh, approaches there. Public key infrastructure based on blockchain, we use the Ethereum blockchain for the moment, for obvious reasons, it is the natural choice. However, um, the whole protocol is layered, it is abstracted to the extent it hopefully could also be extended to other blockchains going forward. Um, we have built in some, let's say, address prefixes, for example, to be able to potentially also include other blockchains in the future. And in the end, yes, a messaging layer underneath, a protocol that can be used. At this point in time, we rely on Whisper, um, but others could be possible as well. I think the third development is clear. I think we really would like to, to extend the protocol to make sure that on each of these layers we, we, we grow. But let me also particularly focus on maybe two topics. First of all, um, the travel rule, or let's say the AML CFD requirements. Um, Chris touched on that. Um, <clears throat> they are not just basically uh, done by just simply making sure we exchange this type of messaging, right? There are other important topics such as, for example, private words, how we deal with them. For example, if I as a VASP have maybe um, verified that a specific wallet is a private wallet to one of my clients, would it not be nice if this information could maybe be made available to other maybe registered or regulated counterparties, potentially, right? Or what if I have, let's say, per day between two clients, maybe a thousands of transactions, would it not be nice to have a bulk, a bulk message, basically, to send it just maybe once a day? Maybe if this is applicable in their respective jurisdiction. And then, of course, we have country-specific flavors. That's obvious, and we have heard it already. Certain countries, uh, will, will, we want to have very specific requirements that you have to fulfill when sending these messages. And that's the reason why this must be extensible. And so the Open VASP Association, we have later on a bit more, will really make sure that all its members from across the globe um, basically bring in these requirements and we will exactly follow their lead. Even more so, let me say this also in a bit of a spirit, we are here quite, quite, quite clear, 
with respect to the travel rule, we're going to solve that in a robust and resilient fashion, a network which is really somehow on pair with SWIFT. We are not trying to say this, although we are very small, but everything has to start somewhere. But it's evident that, of course, we built this infrastructure, this open layered protocol, not just for one specific message type. As you can imagine, the crypto space is a fantastic space with a lot of innovation. And as you can imagine, our members have a lot of ideas how this type of open protocol can be used also beyond the travel rule. And this is certainly, I think, an important area for um, to grow. So that's the reason why it's not called open travel rule, it's called open bus for the reason. So good. Thank you very much, David. I'm Lucas. Uh, Lucas Hook from Signum. Bank again, and most likely some of you um, expected somebody better looking than me today, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately <laughs> now I had to jump in um, and cover for her, for Delphine, you know, from Lickip. So I will cover the Open Vast Association, and basically um, the background about it, he was, like David was, nicely relating to we and, and, and here the question is, what is the we? And, and, and you can imagine also, you know, requirements coming from the FATA, from the regulator, and you are, you know, sitting there on a Monday and then you realize, oh my God, there's even new requirements coming from a regulator and you don't know how it works, what to do. And this is why it's important to have something like an association to come together and also uh, to, to, to somewhat um, focus um, your interests and build something together because, as you can see, if you build, let's say, 20 different standards for, um, you know, um, exchanging messages, at some point it gets really difficult. And this is what we try to do here. Uh, we try to build a network, um, let's say, more or less similar to SWIFT, but of course in, with other design principles. Um, and the idea then is, of course, that for everybody, it's more easy to transact and to be compliant on the same go. So, I need to click. Um, so this brings us to the Open Wasp Association. So right after, in November 2019, I guess, uh, the white paper was published. Uh, later on, some months, um, there was, um, we founded the Open Wasp Association with the, the players uh, David already mentioned. This is very important to see also how, how really crucial this interaction and cooperation is between market players. Uh, and what we also really want to highlight is we don't want to build something for just the Swiss market. We want to build a global standard. And this is why we also are reaching out and, and try to, to get members across the globe so that we are then exactly able to have these uh, seamless transactions around the globe as well, because crypto, as you see, is decentralized. Uh, however, we need to be compliant and, and also have to um, account for all the different jurisdictions and its regulatory bodies. So what we do is basically we look for you with our members that we um, actually maintain this protocol and, and build in this, um, in this so-called OB process that we um, um, enhance the, pro uh, the protocol and also look what the regulator is bringing in, in new requirements that we are already um, always up to date and also you as the, um, the client or the user of this protocol. Um, what we also do is we, we reduce your administrative burden by providing you with uh, documents and, and all, all the required um, administrative um, stuff. Then, in addition, what we also do, we talk to uh, supranational and national regulatory bodies and, and also are, you know, somewhat funneling the, the requirements and interests of, 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 the, of the stakeholders and also thought leaders because in the most cases also uh, regulatory bodies are really interested also to see what comes from bottom up and not only just dictate uh, what they seem best. So this is important to mention. Uh, what we also do, we fund it and will fund um, open source implementations of uh, the protocol. There are already some solutions available 
and we'll get to that later. Uh, and of course, we just really support that the ecosystem as said comes um, available over the globe and is easy and seamless to integrate and start using. So let's bring this to the next slide. So what you see here is already we have a lot of association <laughs> members and the numbers growing every day and the day we speak. So what we have is, is really some known brands here in Switzerland, also um, really, uh, um, let's say, institutions which are very, uh, let's say, near to regulation. And then we have also other, let's say, providers coming to the game, uh, let's say, AMAN data providers, you know, certainly some of the, of the brands and also tech providers focusing explicitly on the market, being rather young and innovative startups, but also major players, they are focusing on that topic and take this uh, very seriously. So this also shows you that this is, this is really an important topic for all of us. So as said before, we have implementation partners, so they take the protocol, they take the, this OVIP um, increment and build a real sol solution somewhat also not only open source, but also commercial solutions are available on the market. And I mean, there are very, let's say, known brands in particular in this, let's say, room and maybe also in the video call. I think most people know one another. So I guess these brands are quite known. Otherwise, you cannot do a presentation. So in terms of governance, so what we do, we are uh, an association according to Swiss law. And what we do is we have a general assembly. It takes uh, place at least one time a year. We have articles of association. You can look them up on the website. Then we have, of course, a formal, let's say, um, we have a governing body and a formal process how this is elected. We collect membership fees. This helps us to exactly fund, for example, implementation partners to build open source uh, and also to of course spread our cause uh, and, and the message. Um, what is also important is that every member has a vote on the General Assembly um, beside of individual members and what is important we actually um, we require of course approval for certain um, requests in the General Assembly. However, because we focus on the main group of WASPs, you need to have a third, let's say, majority, a third uh, of these WASPs member which are um, participating in the Open WASP uh, General Assembly needs to be one third approval of the uh, WASP participant, and we call it somewhat a, a veto right. All right, so shape the future with us. So we um, are taking this occasion also to promote OpenWASP a little. So please reach out to us if you're interested. Um, we are very happy to welcome as many as um, possible, um, let's say, future members, helping us to, to grow the network, to make it better, more stable, to exchange information and also be compliant. Um, so you can go onto our website, openwasp.org, but also contact Delphine uh, in case you want to know something or you want to become a member. So I think that is that. So thank you very much. And uh, we are, of course, happy also to answer any further question. Chris, David, and myself, yes, please. Thanks for the presentation. I have a question regarding the members, the current members of the Open Wasp in, uh, on a more global level, Asia, Brazil, Germany. Can you tell us something? Or is it, has it started in Switzerland first and tries to spread over the world? Is this the yeah, so, so basically, David can uh, quickly answer the, the, the real and Chris, uh, how, how the very early beginnings were, because there were some, let's say, some some uh, associations also from 
from Asia involved in, in terms of, uh, let's say, kicking or, or what is it, like starting the initiative. However, right now in terms of members, you see we started really in a focus group in Switzerland, mm -hmm. um, but also with a board member um, focusing more on, on Asia. Uh, and, and being a member also of another um, group of, let's say, interest or association. Uh, but what you see here mainly is we started focused in Switzerland, Central Europe, and then interest came in fr from across the globe, so US, but also Asia, and this is keep, keep on going. But maybe you can no. tell us. <coughs> I'm happy to <coughs> add, add, add here more. I think it was your question. No, yeah. Exactly. I think at this point, I'm more or less, these are the members, I think it's almost, I guess. Um, more, it, more more exactly. <laughs> Um, uh, of course, as you can imagine, yes, there is a certain fee associated, although I must say that the fee is really very beneficial to small countries because we really don't want to attract just a large one in the spirit really of decentralization. Um, so, but of course, yes, we are in talks with many of those, uh, large and small, and I, I think in certain cases, yes, they take their time, uh, also maybe to a funding decision, um, but I think even more so, it is fair to say that, of course, the most of our uh, counterparts um, are interested in using the protocol, and that's perfectly fine. So I think the majority of interactions you have are not so, to be fair, not so much on becoming a member, I think, right? And that's perfectly fine. Um, I think we, in the end, it's primarily when we, we will use it ourselves, of course, we will, we will be happy if that network is, is established, and we're already at quite basically as we speak in these days, after quite an intense testing phase. Um, but um, yes, I think the majority is actually in more interested in how to use, okay, getting information to some extent also with some of uh, the providers. I see also, for example, here Lucas from Tent Analytics, for example, others uh, who, who, for example, also have direct interactions. So I think there's a lot of interest about how to use these protocols, um, but primarily on the usage side. And that, that's perfectly fine. I think we would like to attract, if a, if a fraction of those using the, 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 the protocol also are maybe even interested to support the cause, uh, I think we are very happy. And uh, some of them, I think, also see the, the, the interest of shaping. Uh, how we okay. I have a question. The protocol is not in use yet, right? Or is it in use? Is yeah, of course, so far it has been in testing. Uh, yeah. It has, we always, always had set ourselves the goal to start by 1st of September. Slipped slightly, but <laughs> we are so, so far more or less happy. Uh, we actually deployed uh, the, the mainnet smart contracts uh, yesterday late, but it's not yet official. So I think it's it's now in the, in the mainnet rollout. So we so far have been using the testnet and, uh, and some test test uh, software installations, but now the the mainnet rollout happens. How many members do you expect in the next six months to join? Yeah, that's difficult. Particularly six months, it, it can be quite a can be quite a number. Actually, I think it's probably easier to say within the next, let's say, four weeks. <laughs> that I would say you can expect maybe ten to fifteen. I would let's say that are really very actively uh, being active. But I guess that number can can grow significantly, depending, I think, also on, to be very honest, on the regulatory push that we will see mm -hmm. to some extent, right? Yes. <laughs> of course. There are many competing protocols. Have you ever considered, or maybe more in the future, but merging with other initiatives? I mean, this is an excellent question, of course, particularly coming also from you, uh, which I think is. is uh, it makes our life yes. easier. Absolutely. No, no, I will give you the compliment back, actually. It is indeed true. I think, first and foremost, of course, when we started that point, that, that discussion, there were not so many other protocols out there. <laughs> I think we have been among the first uh, to, 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 let's say, to really outline a complete solution, right? I mean, we had different bits and pieces there. Uh, of course, sending an encrypted message is typically a, a good start, but as I said before, it needs a bit more, right? You really need to see, see the whole flow, you need to see the whole element, there's a bit more to it. There is a, a legal side to it, maybe a certain agreement you need for the network, and so forth, many other pieces. I think we have line, outlined uh, the, the first full package. In the meantime, indeed, we have been also quite pleased that other ideas have, taken, uh, have, have come up. And uh, we, of course, know also these other protocols. We are in close interaction. I, I think it's a friendly competition, so to speak, because in the end, we basically just want to become compliant, right? <laughs> so with respect to collaboration, I think I see it on two, two, on two different levels. I think, first of all, we have seen some collaboration on certain parts. For example, the messaging format um, 
uh, under the so-called uh, IVMS 101 uh, interwasp standard. Basically, some of these protocols have, have already aligned there, V as well, so we are completely have adopted that nucleus of how the messages are formatted, which I think some of the protocols are using as well. Um, so I think there will be a certain convergence there. However, the devil is in the details and you need to, you need to do it first the right yourself before it then can start to come together even more. As, and I think a next layer, and I think that's the point, while of course, uh, which is really good having you here as well. Um, we have all always tried to really establish a, an ecosystem of different software providers, right? Having a really a broad choice for the WASPs and not just one software basically. And we see particularly in, 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 in these uh, software providers that they also try to make the bridge to other protocols. So they are implementing also other different routes, maybe some local ones, some other ideas. And so within the, those software packages, I would say to some extent does this connection come together. Whether in the end it will converge, I do think so. But again, it's very young. We have to do the stuff before we can talk about merging. <laughs> that increase the frictional cost of each transaction? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, if you basically, let's say, in a non-travelable world, uh, and you might not have to send anything across, of course, you can't have it easier than that, right? So whenever basically you are, in for, uh, you, you are, you are forced to, 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 to comply with the standard, with the, with the, with the regulatory requirement to send messages across information about the original beneficiary, this adds a burden. I mean, it's a reality. And so do you have to do it for each transaction, or once you've done a small one, then you can proceed? So that's, that's the point, basically. At this point in time, we start really with a one-to-one -one relation, I think, as, all, as most protocols. Yeah, I mean, in, of course, by basically making sure we have a, a, a straight-through process, in which I think most of our best will, 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 will make sure. So these systems, of course, strongly API-based, um, will allow you to really, with your backend, to integrate. However, I think, as mentioned before, also adding, for example, bulk messages that you, if you, let's say, between two counterparties that know each other well, mm -hmm. and let's say are in, in a jurisdiction which, which allows this type of, of treatment, um, we do plan for these type of also bulk messages. So I think we will see an evolution there as well. But I think short answer, one more, once more, yes, it adds a burden. I think our task is to make sure we have a protocol which is as, as a straight through processing, able as possible, and adding these type of different message flavors that hopefully the burden basically can be brought down to a minimum. But some transaction below 1,000 Swiss francs, you said, that you don't um, have to... Yeah, unfortunately, in, in, in case of Switzerland, uh, basically this, 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 um, this threshold is actually even applicable. On a global level, there is uh, this, this, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this uh, the ability, right? But um, in Switzerland, we basically have a zero threshold, but yeah. please not. Anytime you engage in money transmission between three parties, it's the threshold is zero. So if you're doing an exchange between two parties, then you would have a higher threshold. But FINMA expects you to be able to prove that it's two parties to be able to apply that higher threshold. And so you, the default is it's a money transmission between three parties, zero threshold. So for every transaction, the travel rule applies. So the burden right now is, is a lot higher in Switzerland if you're regulated than hopefully this solution once a lot of network uh, participants are using it. Because right now what you need to do first, you need to prove that the, the sender or the beneficiary or originator and beneficiary outside of, of uh, let's say, of your institution um, is the wallet holder. So first you need to get this proof of wallet ownership. And this is somewhat a little <laughs> advert advertentious. Um, but on the other hand, once you did so, you also need to identify, if it, if, if it uh, is a third party, you need to in addition identify this user af as if he would be your own client. So the burden is super high, that's why a lot of uh, institutions, regulated institutions, they don't engage even in third party transactions right now because it's just not worth the effort in some case, and, uh, and particularly not for low transactions. Um, and, and as uh, Chris and David said, so there is no, you, you need to go through the full process also for 10 or 100 Swiss francs. And if the counterparty is a company, you have to go find the final beneficial owner? Or? 
Yeah, I'm referring exactly in Switzerland, actually, uh, there's no differentiation. So it's, it's the same as with, a, with a, let's say, a private audit you're interacting with. So there you need to obtain the proof that your client, Ben, or how you <laughs> they call him, Ben is actually sending from his Nano ledger, for example. And then you need to get, let's say, a signed message or whatever to prove that he has access at least to the private key. Same goes also if, if he sends from Coinbase. So there he needs to prove, or you need to get proof, that Ben has an account on, on Coinbase and he's sending to you. And unless you don't have a bilateral way with Coinbase, for example, via, let's say, in the best case, an API, and so he, you send, let's say, the address and Coinbase returns the client name, which is not really you know, a realistic scenario, uh, as long as you don't have this, you, you need to do exactly the same. And once you have the proof, you need to identify if, if it's not your client already. I think it's, it, <coughs> it's worth mentioning that indeed, I think the OpenVAS protocol per se really ha has a global, a global architecture. But yes, I think coming from basically from Switzerland, where we have basically the gold standard as of right now, uh, <laughs> we have some add-ons. We <laughs> have to make sure it works as well. <laughs> market at the moment is moving toward decentralization. How will you use your protocol towards decentralization in a specific field? Yeah. Now it's excellent. I think, <clears throat> of course, we don't know all the answers yet, right? We are also in development, but as you can imagine, um, by, the de by the decision to really basically establish your identity as a WASP, as an intermediary, right, via a specific um, smart contract that only you own, basically, right? Um, so the WASP code that identifies you as, as the intermediary is your WASP contract that is deployed as part of, of this standard. Um, so by, by doing so, we are already relatively close to the approach that a contract, a smart contract, could be the intermediary, right? Yeah. I think that that is really, and that, that has been, I think, one of the key uh, thoughts that we, that we had, right? I, 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 by really embracing uh, particularly this DeFi, uh, this DeFi uh, um, tenancies. And we are aware that regulators um, uh, are also aware of this. There is also a debate to what extent can also can the future intermediary in basically smart contract, how can such a player be, 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 be uh, basically be included in, in the able framework. So I think on, 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 that, on that element, I think we have a certain chance that um, indeed these rules could also be coded in, into smart contracts. But of course, we are in the beginning. That's actually my, my favorite uh, question because it was such a central tenant into the design of the protocol and as, as David sort of tried to explain that basically a VASP can create a code or obtain a code and then they can use that code to start using the protocol. Um, and then if you want to be identified at a higher level, so to allow your counterparties to understand who you are and be sure of who you are, you can go through additional steps of being authenticated as a VASP, as an entity that owns that code. So the OpenVASP Association will run um, a smart contract where you can call your VASP code that you use to use the protocol, but then the higher level will be to be authenticated by the association. So there will be a process that a VASP can go through where we as the association will verify that they are a bona fide entity and that they do own that VASP code. And they will be listed in a directory. And that's really the the competitive advantage of our protocol um, and one of the central tenets of the Open Vast Association is that um, if you are wanting to interact with a counterparty and you see that they have a vast code, you could then go to the directory and say, okay, that really is Bitcoin Swiss. They really do own that vast code or that really is SEBA. That is um, a trusted party. They have been verified by the Open Vast Association. And the value of having these two different stages is exactly that, is that if you, for example, are in Venezuela and you know that you're being um, watched by your uh, domestic regulator or wherever in Iran, whoever, whatever country you might be, but you still want to have access to this decentralized financial system, you can call independently um, the smart contract and get your own VASP code and continue to interact with counterparties without being cut out of the new financial system that we're creating. So that was really important to us that um, whatever design we have is not um, subject to political manipulation. 
So you can always use the protocol, um, you know, regardless of who you are, where you're listed. But for those who want to interact only with bona fide parties that have been verified, that are not sanctioned, we will have a separate um, FAST directory. So technically it's using a transaction that should be peer-to-peer, -peer. it's peer protocol, protocol peer. Um, well, the, the peer will use the protocol as a means of transmission, essentially. The, the protocol is the framework that they will use to structure their data, and then the data will be transmitted using, for the, for the current Ethereum Whisper, but essentially it's still a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. There is no third-party protocol, centralized protocol, that's controlling the flow of funds. And if, if the other, if the other uh, party is not aligned with the protocol, the transaction is declined. Um, yeah, they would have to have, well, for the, for the obviously, David, no, David, uh, David will uh, experience, uh, he can yeah, explain no, Whisper but I think you, <laughs> better you, than I can. You said it right before. So basically, the, the, the blockchain transaction per se is not touched at all, right? So this is really when we go back to this, I think there was this little image here. So I think it's still true, basically, you know, that really the, the underlying transaction we don't touch, right? That is that's done as, 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 as usual. So what we talk about, when we talk about the protocol, the open mass protocol, we really only talk about the add-on layer that really exchanges information, right? As peer-to-peer -peer message. And also not on the blockchain. It's not, not stored on the blockchain in anything, right? We simply use here Ethereum smart contracts for the public key to store as a public key infrastructure component. Yeah. And then the messages exchanged are simply messages, right, off-chain. Uh, and of course, yes, they have nothing to do per se, <laughs> technically, with the underlying transaction. Um, what, we, what we basically propose as part of the overall flow is that when, when those two want to do, those two uh, intermediaries want to do a, a, a transaction on behalf of their clients, that they basically, as part of the flow, the um, beneficiary VASP will basically tell the originator was, hey, by the way, since I have accepted that you will send me, let's say, one Bitcoin uh, on behalf of one of my clients, please use address so-and-so for your, for your transaction, which actually has also logistical advantages because, um, I'm speaking once more with my, my Bitcoin Swiss hat on, as you can imagine, we have many clients, and of course, when they basically uh, interact with us and send or receive funds, uh, we don't want basically just to receive all of a sudden funds from someone, right? <laughs> you rather want to basically really have that type of, when it's with an intermediary, uh, such as a Signum or Seba or Lücke, uh, ideally we want to have these messages first. Ah, okay, basically they're, send, they're sending on behalf of their client, and then we can basically communicate our landing address at this point in time, which also makes it easy for us to maintain, for example, the address universe of, of, of incoming addresses which you might also want to change for privacy reasons and so forth. So you will have, like, um, the, the use case will be like more business to business. Yes, it is really, it is really, that's also the also reason why VASP, right. it's really VASP to VASP. It is not peer to peer, right? Yeah, I think, peer exactly, that's not, that's, that's not needed there at this point in time, right? As long as the regulators allow, let's hope it stays there. <laughs> we want that, of course, we want that. Uh, it's really for that, for that VASP to VASP situation, where, however, these regulations do kick in, right? Which is different than some of our competitors. There are quite a few solutions available on the market that is that are centralized. So they will, for example, have um, a proprietary protocol here where you have to be um, authenticated, and then they will transmit the the message on their protocol or on their platform um, to a beneficiary VASP that has also been authenticated by them. So there's a certain level of centrality and control. And the way the, you know this one of the central tenets of Open VASP is that essentially you as a VASP here can choose any software service provider um, to implement the protocol or you can implement it yourself. You can go to GitHub and um, implement it yourself, and then you can use any method that you want, essentially, that works for you for the transmission. Right now, we're working with Whisper, um, and uh, as long as the recipient or beneficiary of ASP also has um, the capacity to receive those messages, um, then it is purely peer-to-peer -peer with no involvement of the association. And as David said, it's completely off-chain, um, and it's encrypted, so the personal identifiable information of your clients is protected. Any 
questions? What if Swift, for example, will create such a centralized protocol that most of the financial players are already like using Swift messages to send money? What if they say, okay, we are now doing that for crypto uh, to, to give to so is the only advantage over the Swift network the decentralization or are there any other benefits to use open bus token? I think we probably all have our own opinions on that. Um, I think the, the challenge with, um, with distributed ledgers, as, as everybody can appreciate, is that um, unlike um, SWIFT, when a, a, a message is sent between banks, um, you don't necessarily have access to the entire history of the person's transaction. And so um, the protection of PII um, is really important in the blockchain space. Um, and so if SWIFT were to engage in developing some kind of centralized solution, which they probably are. Um, we would hope that they would put a lot of emphasis on data protection, um, which is one of the central tenets of OpenVAS. We really designed it to make sure that information that's tied to this transaction cannot be discovered or um, um, commercialized in any way by any third party. So if you have a service provider like Swift or some other centralized service provider that has its own proprietary black, um, blockchain, or sorry, platform for the transmission of data, I would just be very, very critical as to how they're protecting your client information. Anything else? Yeah. Of course, uh, <clears throat> absolutely. I think we do care very much about privacy, absolutely. I think uh, we want to be compliant, fully compliant with the email law, but at the same time, really very strong on privacy. I think in addition, um, I would say, of course, now speaking for, I think, most of our members, in the end, we just want to have it solved, to be honest, right? I mean, we, we want to serve our clients, but we want to be compliant. So in the end, that's also the reason, I mean, Open Wasp is a non-profit, right? We, we do that to have a, a solution out there. So if it would have been solved already, we wouldn't be here, basically. As of right now, nobody helped us so far, right? So I think that, we, that that's the reason why we started. But I think what, in general terms, I think it may be also an interesting angle here that we sometimes discuss, I mean, uh, of course, also uh, networks like SWIFT, uh, which originally have on, only been here for the regulated financial intermediaries and banks, have of course opened up to, to, to larger commercial uh, corporates and stuff. Still, I think we all know that the, the vast space is an even more diverse space, right? Across the globe, there are many uh, innovative, also small companies, startups, uh, tax, decentralized, uh, decentralized uh, uh, schema, schema plus. And I think they should also have a chance basically to to be a part of the game. But of course, fulfilling these challenging AML requirements and laws, right? Being, being fully compliant, and at the same time having a, a low barrier, not a big ticket fee. I mean, we know how much you, you have to pay, for example, to operate Swift, right? It comes at hefty as a hefty fee. Now, clearly, I think this is the disruptive part for the industry, not for, well, not for our association. We won't earn anything there, but uh, I think for an industry, we, we clearly, I think, we should make sure that the crypto revolution is also extended to the regulatory space, right? Uh, it should not be that this fulfilling these regulatory requirements really limits uh, the, the number of players. I think that's a spirit I would say. Maybe just one comment to that, and maybe you can comment on that as well. Like, here we talk about financial intermediaries, banks, and so on, but we all know that there are social media platforms which are potentially becoming financial service providers which have a different history of using data <laughs> in different areas and different <laughs> means. And so maybe this potential use case protects that information when it's used not just by people <coughs> who are banks with, with that kind of a name on the door. What would you say? I think <coughs> I can only repeat, I think absolutely, I think privacy really by design at the center of our, what we do. And I think then we, that, that will serve us all, I would say. <laughs>